So today we're going to rip in and keep going with the teardown of this Meteor V12 27 litre. If you guys haven't seen our first two episodes, we recommend you pause this one and jump on and go watch those two first. It's only a couple of hours and then come back to us. Um, are you with us there somewhere, Tony? Oh, yep. I'm doing the building. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, today we're just going to concentrate on one of the banks. We're going to pull all these castle nuts off and all these split pins. There's probably a couple of hours work here just removing all this. So it'll just be one that we can just rip in and try and get this thing torn down some more. Um, we'll have a bit of a chit chat like we do along the way. Grab a beer or a coffee or a tea or a scone and sit down and um, enjoy the episode. It's a tank. Oh yeah? The tank is a rock. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm just taking off this uh, this line off the end of the cylinder header here with that little canister with it. It was supposed to hold that um, revision document in there. Um, and then uh, we'll start from I'll start from this end with all of the castle nuts for the valve gear. And that this bridge doesn't just secure the camshaft as you can see; it's the rocker shafts as well. So the pivot shafts, the rocker seal. Um, so gradually we'll start to get we'll get the split pins out and some of the nuts off. Um, we're going to back off all of these uh, tappet screws, these adjusters here. Um, and then we'll work towards lifting that off as, as an assembly. So good to hear some of the, or read some of the comments from the last one about the stories of Rolls Royce that I was telling them about the crew factory. There was some, uh, some uh, enlightening uh, information there. I was really pleased to read that. I was happy because it was about, uh, oh, it could be more, about 20 or 25 years since I was there. Um, and uh, uh, it was a pleasant experience, a unique one. Everyone. Some of you might have noticed something new on the wall behind us here too. I guess that's in shot now. <laughs> Here's, uh, it's a bit of a, bit of a faded, uh, damaged uh, photograph. Um, this was actually saved from being um, thrown away. It was out in, the, in a rubbish stack, if you like. Um, and you can see there's a, a, a formation of uh, Leopard 1 main battle tanks from the Australian Army. Probably in the late 70s. I think Australia acquired these Leopard 1s in about 77 or 78. So late 70s was the, uh, was the acquisition date of them. And yeah, it's quite a nice little formation of them there. Um, Where are they from? The Leopard 1s? Oh, these are German tanks, yeah. German yeah, tanks. So yeah. the Leopard 1 was the, the first evolution of the Leopard name and then Leopard 2 is the, was the successor. Oh, this is the V10 diesel? Yes, yes, yes. So that's yes. the um, piston yeah, the eight, we showed this is in the last Yeah, that's right. Oh, the, eight, okay. the A38 right. CAM500 I mentioned. Yeah, that's what powered these. Someone wrote in the comments on that last video, they had a, a sad experience where they had to fill the engines or the tank with concrete to be displayed in front of uh, like return services clubs around Australia, and he said it was. A, he said oh, I would be heartbroken <laughs> to know that story, and it is sad because they they were a beautiful machine for that for their era. They were fantastic. But yeah, we saved this. This used to hang on the wall inside the office of MTU Australia, um, and obviously they're an MTU engine, and this was inside the uh, inside the main office on the wall. It's a bit battered and faded yeah, now, but it's yeah. sort of. It was. It, I, me I remember when it was uh, fresh and, <laughs> and a nice photograph, but uh, yeah, it's been. Uh, it lost its favour, or, or you know, there were other things that wanted to, they wanted to put up, so they just got rid of it and threw it out and left it out in the sun. And, but we can still see it. Maybe someone watching could be one of these commanders uh, or, or crew members st sitting up in, in, one of the, um, in one of the turrets. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And where was that taken, that picture? Don't know. Well, I went to visit the, um, the maintenance uh, facility at, uh, in Bandiana in Victoria at Four Base, um, where they used to overhaul the engines. And I remember speaking to some of the, some of the senior people there and they said, oh, um, the Meteors they had prior to the, um, to the uh, Leopard A38s um, were run in and, and tested on the same engine uh, dynamometer. So that they just adapted the dynamometer to suit the uh, the diesels, the MTUs, um, which were previously used for the Merlins, uh, the Meteors, sorry. And um, interesting story, when I looked at the dynamometer, there was a very large electric motor with a series of big V-belts driving onto the back of the, the water brake coupling, basically, between the engine and the dynamometer. And I asked the question, what do you use this electric motor for? And they said, ah, oh, the Meteors, they said, there was something about... Uh, 
There's a chrome section of the cylinder liner at the top of the bore. It's, uh, it's, it's not the full length of the cylinder. It's a very thin layer of chrome in the top of the bore. And they said, we used to take the spark plugs out of the, the engines and wind them over with the electric motor for 24 hours before we fired them to get some initial bedding in of that ring in the chrome because the chrome's so hard. This is when it's a brand new engine? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So new cylinder liner, new chroming, new rings. Um, I was blown away. Wow. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's a, that's a process that you wouldn't anticipate having requiring, yeah, having to do, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well. So then another bit of trivia. Pro obviously, someone out there will know more about it, but that's the story I remember. And don't forget, it's 25 years ago since I, or well, maybe more since I encountered that story, but I remember that as being something interesting. There's a lot of split pins to do here, Tony. We've got, um, you know, probably. I don't know, 50 of these things to do. They're yeah. taking a little bit of time. It's hard to see them with all this Cosmoline on here. We yeah. did try to melt some of it off with a heat gun yesterday, but... It, it just made it shiny. <laughs> it just thinned it out and made it look better, but it didn't make it go it, away. It did run away slightly, but it'd be a lot of work to get rid of it properly. I'll go, I'll run across there and back off all those um, tappet screws too, before we go too far. Right, so the process that we're thinking is not only do we remove all the split pins, which that can be done and nothing's coming apart at that point. All the nuts will still be tight, of course, but we'll relieve all the, the tappets here that push down on top of the valves. That way, that'll relax all the rocker arms. So when we do undo all these, we don't have the cam trying to be pushed up off its pedestal or, or journal, no stress which can risk breaking the cam. It's such a long camshaft that would just snap like a twig if we just went and undid all these first without relieving the, the valve spring pressure off the valves and all the tappets. We'll do all the split pins and we'll go through and do all these. So you can see the, <clears throat> the outer uh, pipe protection from the shaft that drives the camshaft from this bevel drive here. You can see there's a couple of castle nuts here and like a gland sort of a seal arrangement and more lock tabs there. Intricate uh, way of doing it. And straight behind with just got a few more numbers there on the on the cylinder case as well. Once we get it all off, we'll clean those numbers up and do a proper like a a series of them of shots so that all of those numbers can be um, seen by everybody. And in an effort to um, try and track down the history of this engine. Alright, so we've, um, we've changed our direction a little bit. We've gone through and removed all the split pins off these main pedestals for the cam hardware. We started removing split pins from the smaller castle nuts, but realised it's probably better we give this thing a wash, which we can remove one, two, three. This will all come off together when we just remove these caps here. These ones are just a, a cup holding the cam to the bridge. so. We don't need to undo those yet, so we'll give this a wash and that'll be easy to do on the bench. So we've backed all these ones off, as you can see. And Tony's just, it's got the T-bar there and he's gonna start spinning them right back. We've got a little bit of nose pressure still on some of these valves pushing up on the cam. We've backed all the, all the lashes off on all of them as far as we can. So um, you can probably watch on in now and we'll be able to wrestle this thing off pretty quickly.
beautiful. So they're all turning nice and freely. Looks like some sort of mechanical insect, doesn't it? So this is interesting. We've got we've got an identity. Um, you know, each one, each valve spring has an, a corresponding. Uh, stamping next to it here you can see for example yeah I don't know whether it'll wash off or not some of the other ones are here are easy to read and it's starting from this end of the engine it's, it's in numerical order and that's all a prefix of B so B13, B14, B15, B16 for example B17, 18, B19, 20 and so on so I'm assuming this is the B bank or B side of the engine and they could have an A there is an A over this side I can okay. see it yep. Yep. Yeah, I know where to look so when you disassemble everything, you can keep everything in the right order um, according to those IDs. S5310B. Jeez, there's a lot of, lot of stampings in here for... You know, we've got mm. a number across here, a number across here. That'll mean something to someone watching, I'm sure. So I can't see any identity on the nut, on these large castle nuts, as we were talking about. With the, oh, the... Um, just an index for the, the phasing of the the pin of the thread versus the uh, slot. So it's just a plain nut. I was, you know, just hypothetically, I was suspicious there was a like a coding system to alter the phasing of the slots versus the, the thread, uh, so that they were talked. But not with these ones. Right, so we've just got our hot wash heating up. We'll give that a spin, hopefully, and see how it cleans up. Uh, is it marked B? Yeah, let's. It probably is. Let's look for something uh, actually, underneath the, uh, a, on the top here. I've got a B five and a B four. Yep. yep. So all yep. the all, all the um, caps, pedestal yep. caps are marked B yep. one through to five, six, seven. Yeah, B two here. Uh, nothing on the top there, but yeah, you can see a B two there. Two, all right, so they're all four, identified. Five, six. So we can wash them up and. Let's get it out there now. Get it off the floor. I'll take it out. Yep. All right. I'll go and get the other one. All right. So if we just roll it. Yeah. Oh yeah, this will be good. Oh, crack on off this. And how are you turning those pins up on the lushes? Are you just <coughs> using needle most of them, and turning them? Yeah, most of them are coming up with the nut, but some needed that. So that one's okay, that one, that one, that one. This one here is really hard on the nose. Yeah. So both rocker camshaft assemblies are in our spinner, our hot wash. We'll give it 10 minutes at 70 degrees Celsius and see how it comes out. Yeah. Yeah, we just noticed something on this uh, A side here. It's another piece of debris. It looks like a rock, another rock. It really is a tank. All the terrain. How did it get in there? It's obviously been in there for a while. Probably doing some sort of maintenance. I think it's a rock. We'll analyze it, we'll clean it up. And we'll check it out. It's rather round, it might have been being battered around. Anyway, we'll check that out.
Here you can see, <coughs> looks like we're getting the transition for the oil up into the rocker assembly here through this rocker pedestal. There to be the oil pressure feed com coming up into the rocker shaft there. Well, look, they've sprayed right up inside here and drowned the valves in, in that. Now, uh, I don't know if I can get on my light in there. Let me illuminate the situation. Yeah, they've really gone to town with the Cosmoly in there. Haven't they? It's uh, well preserved. Now, some of those valves would have been open, or they may have even barred the engine over while they were spraying to open the valves on this side to get the Cosmoline possibly into the cylinder because it would have been a lot harder to get it in the inlet valve. So I'd say if they were going to get some preservative into the cylinders, this is how they would have done it. And there's that's really a lot in there, so I, I, I suspect that's what they've done. They've barred it over as they were spraying in when the valves are open. It's entered the cylinder and fogged, fogged the cylinder basically with Cosmoly. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before we slip the, the head off and the other assemblies, uh, this bevel drive camshaft, camshaft drive needs to be disconnected. This is the upper end here. We've, we've got little, four little nuts there. We've got a circlip holding the bevel gear on the shaft. And there's little lock tabs around those nuts. It's covered in Cosmoline like everything else, so it's a bit fiddly and sticky to get everything off. And on the underside, if we pan around here, uh, where this tube, the external tube is for the shaft, we've got a flange here. There's probably lock tabs on these four screws as well. Then we've got two locking castle nuts and there's lock tabs here as well. Um, so again, we're just going to fiddle around and undo this and disconnect this assembly here before we lift anything up so we don't want to damage anything. This water uh, feed line here, we'll strip it off as well. That's just directly out of the water pump, feeding to each bank. And this line's already a little bit loose, so we'll just slip that off and then take that, the manifold off the side, the water manifold. And at that stage, just about everything's loose off the cylinder head, so we'll start to then um, remove this part of the engine, the cylinder head, and the cylinder case possibly. We'll see how we go. and then it's a split um, bendable part. All right, so we've taken one of the lock nuts off the flange, but um, we'll start with the, the gear first. The circlip's out and the gear comes off the shaft with a guide body that sits into that flange. And then it looks like there's a, there is a thrust washer here inside. And there you can see the internal spline. And there's the drive shaft, which then is just sitting in and just lifts out. And this spigot on this end of the shaft is larger in diameter than this end, so you can't mix it up. It won't go through that thrust washer. All right, now, there's a piece of something down here just sitting in the cylinder head. It looks like a little bit of a tooth of a gear. Now, this gear doesn't appear to be, even though it's covered in cosmoline. I can't see any missing piece. But we'll confirm. Once it's uh, cleaned, we'll confirm that it's complete. But there is definitely a little piece of a, lo looks like to be a, a tooth off a gear there. Yep, it's just broken clean off, a little spur tooth. All right, we'll keep that and find out where that's from. It's 
magnetic. It's not a very interesting, <laughs> it's not a uniform shape. I can't see any machine surface anywhere. But that was just sitting there next to that solenoid bolt. And you will. Uh, I can't see anything else. But we'll wash that as well. It's just looking right across the head. No. No. All right. So that's the second piece of material. It's a. Uh, it just it just looks like a, actually a rock, but it's magnetic. Um, it's quite magnetic. So it's a piece of iron of some kind or something. So we'll wash that later and find out what that is. Does it match? Oh, oh wait, hang on. the taco. Yes. There it is. This is it here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We're gonna. <laughs> there it is. There. It's right there. There's the missing tooth, and this is um, a tachometer drive assembly at the end of the cylinder head and that's where it, there you go I'm missing from there that's unusual that that would break because you'd think there'd be hardly any load on that whatsoever do you think it, maybe that, a bit of rock or material has gone in between and just broken it we have seen some debris in there haven't we <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that is interesting okay well that's our missing tooth where it comes from anyway but that other piece is a mystery let me give it a quick wash What is it? Oh. And that's metallic, is it? Well, it's magnetic. So it's some kind of ferric. Oh. It's not very strong though, is it? Like it's got something in it, but it's well, not. Well, I don't know whether a piece of iron ore would do that if it was, you know, just mineral ore. But it looks like a rock. It's heavily corroded if it's. Yeah, it just looks like a rock. Mm. A little stone, a pebble. It's quite light too. Well, like it doesn't small. feel like what it. Yeah, would, that's it, true. It, it it is quite light. Hmm. We'll keep digging. See that that sleeve can probably stay there because it looks like that's just a bush that that upper um, bevel gear ran in. All right. Well, maybe wind the nut back on or. Yeah, we'll put the tab and the nut back on because it looks like it just ends, and then the other connection is this outer tube down here with these castle nuts. So yeah, we'll loosely put that nut and the lock tab back on. Okay. Oh, well, this is an adjustable lock tab. Look at the trouble they've gone to. You can see that lock tab, the square section sitting into the slot in the, in the castle nut. Well, that, that's part of this assembly here, where you've got a, a slot here and two nuts to actually adjust that so that where you end up with, with the slot, you can actually adjust the lock tab to go into the right place. Think of the complications involved in, in, in designing and, and actually making this at a time when you know, pressure's on to do something, and they go, no, this is the right way. <laughs> uh, there could have been a simpler way, but at the time, this is probably the best they had, that's the idea. Oh, and surprise, surprise, there's no lock tab on the nuts on the lock tab. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so see. those nuts can just... Oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> High risk. <laughs> You wouldn't think there'd be something so small, you know, so, but... Well, there's nothing that small on the small engines we work on. No. Maybe on the electrical side, but not on the mechanical side. So that's a, a lock ring. Here's ah, another locking tab. Right, right. For, oh, that screw was holding. For that banjo bolt. Right, okay, yep. Notice. That's what that was doing, because it's got a multi, yep. or a 12 point. Yep, um, and, a, and a, an elongation as well. Yes, just so it can end so up. Get in. I guess because it's an aircraft derivative engine, you've got to build in that security. Yeah. You know, over time, probably. Now, what size do you think that'll be? Let's try a three-eight Whitworth. See if that goes on there. Yeah. Yep. Oh, there we go. All right. So while Tony's down there on that bevel drive shaft, I'm just going to touch on these. Uh, head bolts or studs, nuts for the the cylinder case and head. So half inch Whitworth seems to fit nicely on those. Well, and they're not very tight at all actually, they're quite... Let's try another one. Yeah, they're actually quite loose. Tony, these are quite loose. Like there's no effort to undo these. Wow. I, I don't know what... 
They oh, should be like. No, no, no. They're all the same. <clears throat> yep. That one's tight. <clears throat> As in, I. Yeah, that's that, what you'd expect to crack it. Yeah, that's tight. But yeah, these ones. Really? All of yeah. them? Uh, the stud's turning with that one. Okay. Bit awkward to get in there as the shape of the, mm. the head goes okay, up. I can't we, get down, but we might find a gasket issue under here yeah. on this side, maybe. Well, I might spin off as many as yeah, I can. Yeah, and yeah, they've got seeing a as though they're loose, I yeah. can just go anywhere. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, quite a fine thread on these, too. Yes, that's English. They've actually got a step on the bottom of the nut. Just to help locate this In that plate that's around plate, it. Yep, yep. Yep. And that thrust plate's just sitting on dowels by the look of it, and that should just lift off. Yep, yep, yep. there it is. Oh, this does it, the dowels are with the plate. I've got it. And that'll locate in the head. Yep. There they are. Yeah, and there's the step for the, for the actual nut to locate into the thrust plate. So that, that stud's quite, it wobbles around a fair bit. Should that turn out or do we leave that in position? Oh no, I think it'll stay in position. Because um, they'll, they'll be anchored down into the into the crank case through the cylinder case, through the cylinder head. All right, well I'll try and buzz off as many of these nuts as I can and get all this hardware apart mm. in preparation to be able to start lifting this thing and seeing yep. what happens. Yep. yep. But yeah, there was a, an aircraft engine came into their premises and mm. it had a tank uh, what was it, a fuel pump gear, I think, on there? Which was, they're, they're different, you're not meant to use them, and it oh. shattered. Oh. So it was engine failure in the sky. Oh, oh, really? Well, it, I, well, it was engine failure in an aircraft, yep. whether it was about to take off or land, or I don't know, mm. but um, okay. there's all lightning holes around all the gears for the aircraft version, but they're also a completely different alloy or oh, metal. Right. The tank ones brittle and break mm -hmm. after I think 100 hours or I think it was about 100 hours they said it broke. Whereas the aircraft ones I haven't seen one break. Yeah. That's that's the interesting thing about aircraft component design during the 40s you know there was a rapid progression from probably the 30s when things started to really ramp up but it was through necessity you know uh, military conflict uh, dictates innovation you know, and rapid prototyping and, and advancement. And then, um, I think I mentioned before, that's their, that was the background of um, Sir Jack Brabham, three-time F1 world champion. He was an aircraft uh, mechanic during World War II. Okay. He picked up that, that uh, interest and that expertise uh, that he'd learnt on the aircraft engines later in his F1 career. Right. So that was the background of <laughs> sowing the seeds, so to speak, of Sir Jack's background. Yeah, Australian race car driver. Yeah, I mentioned the other day, I think uh, I read somewhere that his first world championship was won uh, with him not in the cockpit of the car. He'd run out of fuel on the last, oh, so last, he was outside the last car. corner. He had to finish higher than a certain position to get over the line and he was just within sight of the finish line so he jumped out of the car and started to push. <laughs> <laughs> So he must have been a good distance in front to still be able to... Yeah, yeah, that's right. And he managed to push it over the line before the, uh, the, the second place car, whatever it was, uh, got over the line before him. And he, that was his world championship. Okay. Imagine that happening today. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen a <laughs> Lewis, get right. out! <laughs> push! Yeah. No way, man, I'm not pushing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are significantly tighter on the top side of this compared to the bottom. I wonder why that is. I don't know. Hard to say. It doesn't look it does. like it's been disturbed, mm. but we don't know. No, I, I'd be interested to see if we've got a compromise in the in the gasket under here, and then we'll know that could be the reason why they've taken it out, preserved it yep. for potential, uh, you know, pull, pull reconditioning later on if need be. But it, obviously, it never got to that stage, and it was just in storage all this time, waiting for someone to give it some TLC. <laughs> but it's a shame we didn't have the the maintenance record document. Yeah, in that it? canister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, once we clean it all down, we can get a good reading of all the numbers stamped on it around and 
you know, we could maybe go to the museum, the tank museum yes. in Australia and yeah. give them all the numbers. Yeah. They might be able to they might have, go uh, back to yeah. a source they've got and, and or find. At least, or at least put it in some kind of a window of a gap that they have, they've got, possibly. We don't know what they They might have got. some matching they, engines know, around it. It's going to be good to talk to them, actually. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but uh, that's the intention. Yep. I know what I'm going to do, Lawrence. I'm going to raid your toolbox and go and grab those ignition spanners that you've got. Okay. Because I think that's one of the easiest way I'm going to get these these tiny nuts out. Okay. Yep. Go for it. Those old ignition spanners. I mean, look at this. This is definite. Even smaller than Meccano size uh, things. It's just amazing. 4.5 millimeters. I don't want to damage any of this castle nut assembly here, and there's little lock tabs on these on these screws here, so I just want to take my time and get it off as best I can. What have I got there? Eight. There you go. Got it. Three to go. <laughs> so this is a 23mm exactly. Ah, oh, right, yep. Yeah. They're considerably tight. Well, these are not super tight, but they're such a fine thread. These had nothing on them, didn't they? They had nothing, yeah. but because yeah. they're such a fine thread, I assume they're not meant to feel as tight to undo as, say, what we're used to on yeah. a 1.5 yeah. inch yeah, pitch Yeah, for the metric. same torque, you get a higher clamping force with the finer thread, but that's still quite, that looks, you know, quite firm. These, these I would say, are probably feel about right yeah. for what they're meant yeah. to be doing. So that's curious, yeah. Okay. So Lawrence, what you've, uh, feedback you've got so far is that we can separate the cylinder head from the cylinder case or does it have to come off together or? Uh, it's got to come off together okay. because to get the head off the case, we've got all these underneath nuts yeah. and bolts here. Yeah. And yeah. I think they're quite difficult to do in place. And I think there's a lot of the time it's unnecessary to split it yep. for the purposes of pulling it apart, yeah. certainly. but We will because obviously we've got a question about this uh, gas yeah. gasket. Yeah. Yeah. If these are loose, you know, have they been released or yeah. has it released itself? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we'll obviously do a, t a full tear down because you've got either a ring type gasket or a, I think yeah. a composite. Yeah, um, that's right. We, I'm gasket. not sure. I haven't had a look actually. Um, what it's got? It's probably got a like a soft iron ring. Possibly. I think it can have both. It depends if it's the Rover, the Packard. Oh. The, like there's a few right. variations. Right. Okay. So, yep. so I've got one here to get off, but the socket is fouling on the casting. I'll take the rest. Uh, there's another couple of thrust plates here. I'll lift them. They're out. all loose. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get them out. Yep. I might have to turn that down on the lathe. Yeah, to get some clearance, yeah. Get a thin wall socket on there. I've got a 23 mil metric single hex socket here, which fits perfectly on these nuts. I can't get this last one on, it won't fit over because the wall of the socket's too thick. It's fouling on the alloy casting of the head profile in this corner. You can't really see because it's dirty, but I'm just going to go and take some material off this on the lathe and come and get this last nut off. It's just got a blind end on the end of it. Yeah. Don't know if that's a cap or if it's solid to the nut. It's brass. Hmm? Yeah, the four end ones are like that. Yeah. And they don't have the collars around the studs. There is a washer. I've taken them off. That's a thin plate washer. Um, normally that's the case. You don't screw down um, onto aluminium on solid heads, except for, say, a GM LS engine with a flange bolt. Okay. There is no washer there. But, right. But most aluminium heads you don't know. and it's of course it's bitten into the aluminium from the pressure of the nut. Let's get the Texas, Texas oil well out of here. Voila. So this tube's now loose. I once it took the um those screws with the lock tabs out, you can see this 
the tube, the outer tube for that bevel drive for the camshafts is just um, loose there on that face. So these two castle nuts were to adjust that, um, you know, there'll be a variation, a tolerance there, and that would have been the adjustment to bring it down so that it would have um, sealed on the, the O-ring or the gasket or whatever's between here. And then the screws hold it together. He's doing a bit of paleontology in the middle oh, here. Yeah. Um, just trying to scratch out the, the breakaway line of this case just so I can see it because we're going to have to free this up or this will have to all dislodge soon, won't it? Yeah, that's true. All of this... Um, There's a lot of crud probably that's going to be enough to hold it without well, applying a bit of force. Or once we separate it, some of it will drop in. Yeah, that too. There's some new split pins in here, and there's copper washers, and mm -hmm. a lot of mud in here. So, what do you think? Is there just that much dirt that gets inside around the engine compartment yeah. in these? And yeah, you've got to understand. There's going to be a lot of turbulence because of uh, uh, and the dust just lifting all the time and settling, you know. And there's hours and hours of it. Uh, I remember the fellas uh, with the Leopard Ones used to say that they basically in the morning. When, um, they'd start them up in their sheds, they'd idle them out, they'd drive them out to the firing range and then they would just sit there all day with the engine idling for the power and just to do firing practice. Right. And apart from that, it was all off-road work apart from when they were being transported. So all of that dust and dirt is just... And um, this is a dusty country. <laughs> so, so that's why there's a lot of dust. Whereas the Europeans probably have a more moisture problem. It'll be an interesting uh, hearing the stories of maintenance of, of the tank engines, the armoured vehicle engines in North Africa during the early part of the World War II. Oh yeah, the sand. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it might have been something that they hadn't planned on or hadn't um, you know, allowed for. I'd almost expect some corrosion in here with the amount of moisture in this dirt, but it sort of looks okay. Yeah. The top well, coating has probably protected it. Yeah. And there might have been a, a film of oil. Well, there's probably, there is oil in this dirt. Yeah. So, you know, these old engines probably weren't. Do we think that this front gear case is in any way attached to the cylinder case? It doesn't look like it no, is. No. No, not, no I, can, I can see clearance all the way around the bottom here. What we're doing at the moment, we're going to make up a couple of, um, jacking plates that we're going to mount onto these uh, rocker studs here and pull, push on these, these studs that screw, screw down into the, into the crankcase. So we'll put one here and we'll put one here and then we'll gently, gradually jack from either, either end slowly to release uh, the cylinder case from the crankcase. So we're not separating the cylinder head at this point um, and, and to get that off, and we'll separate that later. I'm just going to take off this water manifold now, just while Lawrence is making up that jacking plate. So we've just fabricated this quick little jacking plate up in about half an hour or less, haven't three, we? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, and so we're just going to push down on the, on the studs now and see if we can break the seal. This is very crude. Oh, crude. Crude. It's like we're in the field. We're doing field repairs to our tank. I've okay. actually got a lunch I've got to get to, so we're going to... Got some crabs yeah. for my mum's 65th birthday today, right. so we're going to... Mm -hmm. All right, now, what we're going to look for is, is this uh, breaking of this surface down here. If I jack here, we should get a lift here. So if we can try and, try and see what we're getting there and see how, hard to, how easy that's going to move. So I'm going to screw down now. Yep, we're lifting. You can see the oil 
The draining. You can see it, yeah? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's easy. Well, oh, I, yeah, look at the gap now. You can see I, it. Yeah. If I put the bar under here. I'll just back off the screw. Uh, under this bit here. You, yep. you pull that tanier closer. Yep. Yep. You should be able to just shimmy that around. Yeah, oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah, so yeah. it's released all the way along so, here. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're, yeah. We're, oh, you can see it. You can see the oil squelching in and out there. So we're still yeah. stuck on this end. So all let's right. move our block the plate over, here. over. Yep. We were going to make two plates, but we just tried this one to see uh, how it was going to work. And uh, I don't think we need to make the second plate. We just move it across. All right, guys, so we're back at it again. Uh, we've had to park it for a little while since uh, you just saw us mucking around with this blue jacking device that we made. Had it, having a bit of trouble getting this end of the cylinder case and head up. It's jamming up on a couple of the studs. Tony's just come up with a little cutter that we've had to make in the meantime, which has been successful. We've been able to lift it past the point. Tony, you want to show what we've done there? Tony, we just there? bought this hole saw and had to open it up a little bit to fit over the stud because what had happened here on these end studs, the nut has and the washer has crushed the cylinder head around the thread of the stud and it wasn't releasing. So we've had to relieve a thin sleeve uh, of material removed around the stud just to get the pressure off the stud itself and now we're, we're free and we're, we're going to lift up and there'll be the cylinder head and cylinder case coming off as a unit. Yeah, so we've got our engine crane in here just to support the weight. We'll be prying the, the case up at each end slowly and then just collecting the weight with this in the centre just to balance it. We'll end up putting some chocks under here and just feel our way through it, but you'll watch us have a go at it now and hopefully we'll see it come off shortly. Coming up with the weight. <coughs> Make sure that you know, this weight. So you can see now the bottom of the cylinder line is exposing some of the piston rings where the pistons are in that position. And good thing is they're nice and oily, it's not full of water or anything. Uh, obviously these ones where there's nothing there, the piston's up the cylinder. So that's, that's the con rod there? Yeah, that's yep. the rod there. And you can see, you can just see here that this side has the blade rods. You can just see in there the slot on the con rod. And the, the other side has the fork rod. Let me go up a little bit. Of yeah, keep going, you'll get a better, better view. Look, this is a good view. You can see the three compression rings here. Then you've got the first oil ring, and then you've got the gudgeon pin area in the middle of the skirt, and you've got another oil ring at the bot bottom here to control the oil uh, in the cylinder. Modern engines run usually just the two rings, the top ring, a second ring, and an oil ring. Um, but these are older, older designs, and it's quite common to see older engines um, running more than three rings. But so that fork and blade arrangement there, Tony? Yeah, you this is the now. fork and blade arrangement that um, you can see here. This is the fork rod, you can see for obvious reasons why it's called the fork rod. And the other rod's called the blade rod, which runs through the centre of this rod here. So you can see how they, they move independently. 
as the crank rotates, they oscillate and rotate. And what it means is that the bearing for this fork rod is actually the back of the bearing shell, shell that the blade rod uh, has in its bore. Okay. We'll see that. We'll see that when we get it out. Yeah, I'll explain yeah. that a bit more. But otherwise, it looks like it's in. It's reasonably in good condition. It's obviously not in new condition. Um, you know, it's normal wear on on the components, but. Uh, we were under the impression the engine had been reconditioned when we obtained it, but no, it, it doesn't. You can see by the amount of debris and dirt inside the valley and just the condition of it, but it had been preserved. Yeah, I think when we saw that top end with the worn cam lobes and the rocker arms, obviously, like you said, that probably may not have been heard in running conditions. It probably wasn't enough of a, a wear failure for it to be prominent no. or a reason, but... Yep. For some reason, they've still preserved it and deemed it a good engine. Well, keep in mind, we haven't taken the other bank off yet. We, we don't know what we're going to find in there, but this side looks as though everything was serviceable here. Well, we side. haven't rotated this engine. We haven't barred no, it over. No, we don't know no. if there's any crankshaft problems no. yet or bearing problems, but so but, far, we're looking... It looks promising. Yeah, it looks reasonable. You can see up in the cylinders, you can see the, the Cosmoline that's been sprayed in through the spark plug holes. They've gone really heavy. I don't know if you can get a view up in there. There's quite a lot of it up in that cylinder, and obviously, you know, well preserved. Um, but it's 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 a little varied. This one here has less, and the third one a little bit less again. But you can still see evidence of it, of it being sprayed in there. Um, again, yeah, moderate amount in that one. This one again, you can see how they've sprayed it in. And this one, not much at all. You can just see a little bit of evidence of it there where they've sprayed it in. I wonder how they did it. I wonder if they were barring the engine over slowly when they were spraying or whether they just did it in a static condition. It, we don't know. The it, it the seems situation, something was spraying under good pressure, wasn't it? You yeah, can really see that it's But, but the situation in. it was done, we don't know anything yeah. about it. They may have done it in the vehicle or they may have done it out of the vehicle. They may not have barred it when they were doing it. We don't, we don't know. There's a lot of natural engine oil still on everything. Yeah. We've wiped those clean, but... Yeah, you can see it's a darker, you know, old oil. So, yeah, we just keep going and, and looking for any, any signs of damage that may have put it out of service for some reason. Um, and if we don't find anything... Oh, we did find a little bit of damage, and it's nothing major. I think it was this one here. Yeah, this one. A little bit of material has moved away from here where the... Uh, where the cylinder case sits down. We'll do a little local repair with some, some metal putty in that area there and dress it back so that we get to obtain a new seal in that area there. It looks like it's just fairly minor until we get it further apart. Yep, all right guys, well, thanks for being patient with us on this one. I think it's been nearly six months since we started filming this part three. Uh, we've obviously had some time in between throughout the video to have to stop and park the job and come back to it. So we've come in this morning and we've got that bank off finally. We're real happy about it. Looks good with these big slogs here. Have you got that S54 piston, just a BMW piston there on the bench I had earlier. I just want to quickly show you guys a comparison in size. It's hard to see the scale in the video. But this is a 3.2 litre six cylinder piston from a BMW. And just get a bit of an idea there from a, you know, a road vehicle to a a military vehicle or an aircraft, 3.2 litres versus 27 litres, that's what we're looking at, plus double the amount of pistons. It's pretty impressive. Oh yeah, yeah. No, there are. For the, for right. the era that it came out, it, was an, is, it is a beautiful, beautiful design. They all are, all these old engines, they're really nice. Yeah. No, this is really exciting stuff, so we'll keep going. We'll see you again soon, and again, thanks for watching. And if you've got any questions or comments, put them below. We're always interested in collecting data and sharing the knowledge. Oh, we've got the right and, documentation. Oh yeah, we've got the right document. Someone sent that through. So next episode, we'll pull that up. I'll get all the info on yeah. that, Tony. We'll pull yeah. it up on screen. It's for the Meteor engine. So we'll be able to refer to the gearbox end and work out how this comes apart. Yep. We're sort of halfway through that as well. And um, yeah, we'll keep ripping into it. Yeah, good. See you again soon, guys.